Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan. I'm the Programs Manager at Musculoskeletal Australia and I would like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on common foot problems experienced by people with musculoskeletal conditions. In line with Musculoskeletal Australia's focus on empowering consumers through education and support services, we've been offering a series of webinars for a consumer audience during 2019. Our list of webinars should be on your screens now. Now I know some of you may be watching a webinar for the first time, so if you have any problems during the webinar, please phone the number in the chat box on the left of your screen or type a message in the chat box. My colleague Helen is typing a message in the chat box now. As a backup, everyone will receive a recording of the webinar presentation early by early next week. So if any problem can't be resolved this evening, you'll be able to view the recording. If you are listening via the phone, you will notice a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, our presenter will answer questions at the end of her presentation but you can type questions for her at any time. Again, type your questions in the chat box and press the enter key on your computer. Can I suggest that you don't leave your questions to the last minute as we will aim to finish no later than 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Questions will only be answered during the webinar, so again, this is a reason to not leave your questions to the last minute. I'd also be very grateful if all participants could take a moment to respond to our feedback survey, which will come on this, your screen at the end of tonight's presentation. Our presenter for this evening is Professor Deborah Turner. Professor Turner graduated as a podiatrist in 1996 and worked as a clinical specialist podiatrist in rheumatology and as a researcher at the University of Leeds. She gained her PhD in 2003, which focused on biomechanical foot function in patients with foot, foot ulceration. In 2007, she gained, gained a prestigious Allied Health Professional Academic Fellowship through Arthritis Research UK and undertook formal training in diagnostic ultrasound and injection therapy. She has undertaken a broad program of research focused on investigating how inflammatory arthritis affects the feet, especially in those with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis and juvenile idiopathic arthritis and has published widely in the field. She is currently a Professor of Podiatric Medicine based at the University of Western Sydney since her arrival in Australia in 2015. We're extremely grateful to Debbie for presenting this evening's webinar and without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to her. Thanks very much, Debbie. Thanks for the kind introduction, Jen. Um, yes, I'm delighted to speak to you this evening um, and we're going to focus on um, some of the most common foot problems experienced by people. Um, and we're going to specifically look to focus on ways in which you might be able to manage some of the conditions yourself and highlight where we have um, evidence base to support the treatment interventions that we have. So what do I aim to do with you this evening? Well, as I said, we'll talk about some of the most common causes of foot pain and problems. And what we'll talk about really is around the evidence that supports some of the various um, treatment approaches. And as you'll see as we progress through the talk this evening, unfortunately the foot is a very neglected area for research. And you will find that very often I will be highlighting that we have a lack of high quality evidence to support some of our treatment um, modalities. What we'll talk about are some of the common questions that you may well have hopefully and then at the end I will direct you towards some useful resources that you may find valuable in helping you um, manage some foot problems that you may well have. So how common is foot pain? Well, it's actually very, very common, so it's quite surprising that there's so little research that's actually out there that focuses on some of our um, treatment interventions. Some of the prevalent studies that we have looked um, have looked and established that around one in five people over the age of 45 will suffer from foot pain. And two thirds of these will report significant disabilities in their ability to undertake activities of daily living. When we look at some of the national data sets from the um, United States of America, 
um, there is evidence to support that it's a really common reason why people will go and um, seek an appointment with their physician. Um, it's one of the top 20 um, of office visits um, in patients who are over 65. So we've established that there's not a huge amount of research out there, but um, we are fortunate that we now have some large data sets that allow us to be able to identify some factors that may allow us to predict um, uh, perhaps how some problems will progress over time and uh, allow us to try and establish how we may be better at targeting um, these um, sort of problems, hopefully in the future, to have better treatment outcomes for patients. So the Framington Foot Study, which is from the Massachusetts and USA, is a study of around um, almost 3,500 people. Um, in the UK, there's a large data set of over 5,000 people. And Australia has its own data set in the Northwest Adelaide Health Study um, of just over 4,000 people. So what have we found from some of these large data sets where these people are being tracked over time? Well, we know that you are more likely to develop foot problems as you get older. Generally, foot pain is quite complex and classed as multifactorial with lots of factors having an influence on how it may present. But generally, females um, are much more likely to develop foot problems than males. And some of that may, in fact, be related to some issues with inappropriate footwear, which are far less common in, um, in males than females. As we're learning more, we're um, recognizing that obesity is associated with significant foot problems. It makes sense in the fact that very often we assume that when someone um, is, um, uh, is, is heavier, that their joints will be stressed um, more, and particularly the joints in the feet. However, there is suggestions to um, support that obesity in itself um, can be associated with some increase in pain and potentially some inflammatory mediator. So it can make things like inflammatory arthritis worse. And this is an area of, of research where we're learning more about it. So it's not just the influence of increased forces through joints that's resulting in foot pain um, with obesity. It's also related to perhaps some of those um, inflammatory mediators that may be associated with a centralized pain presentation. So if we have a look at the Framington Foot Study, um, what specific things have we actually learned? Well, um, what often happens with these large data sets is researchers will go and have a look within that data set and post specific um, questions. And um, a group of patients were followed up for a six-year period, and the researchers were really interested in the extent to which foot problems may be related to footwear. What the researchers did was they looked at trying to regionalize the pain. And you can see here from this diagram that they identified pain in their hind foot or rear foot, in the arch, in the forefoot, um, and in the toes. And what they actually found was that um, in this group of patients, a surprisingly large proportion reported um, the presence of generalized um, foot pain on most days. So that was up to a quarter of those that were included in the study. And you can see um, within, um, on, you can see that really there is a mix between um, pain in the rear foot, pain under the heel, but a large proportion of patients um, complaining of pain in the ball of the foot and in the toes. So what did we learn from that particular study? Well, what they actually found was that when they categorized patients into the female patients, into those that they um, identified as, as wearing um, good category shoes, and within that good category shoes, these were shoes very similar to athletic shoes or sneakers, they identified an average shoe of being similar, um, things like um, cowboy boots, work boots, hard sole um, shoes, rubber shoes, and poor shoes were characterized as heels or slippers. And what they actually found is that those that reported that they were wearing shoes from the good category were 67% less likely to report pain in the rear foot 
and this was after the research has adjusted for factors that we know can influence foot pain, like increasing age and weight. So what that indicates to us that really there is an important role in ensuring that we have appropriate footwear to try and reduce our chances of developing foot pain or managing any foot problems that we may well have. So ill-footing footwear um, really can be viewed as being a significant cause of foot pain. And when we think about how we would define ill-footing footwear, it could be that it's inappropriate in, in its length or width, either too big or too short, um, resulting in a, a really sloppy fit around the foot, which can increase things like rubbing and the chances of developing blisters, or generally it can be too tight and, and clamping the foot up. What we do know from studies out there is when people are wearing ill-fitting footwear, it has been linked specifically to changes in um, the way in which people walk, so their walking style, or we can sometimes refer to it as the um, gait pattern. There's certainly um, evidence to support the use of ill-fitting footwear will increase the risk of falls. Because very often people will need to work hard with their toes ripping um, to, to try and keep either a baggy shoe on um, or to create space with an ill footing, a, two, a shoe that's too tight, there can often be problems with balance. And as we can see on the um, picture here, um, when we have a shoe that's too tight, then very often we can develop pressure induced um, lesions on the top of toes. And um, what we can see in this picture here is we've had the development of um, a corn, and we can see that we've got um, the skin has become thickened, but we can also see that it's discolored. And when we have high pressure prolonged over a period of time on a toe like this, sometimes there is the risk that this can be um, that this can develop into an ulcer, and that's more of a challenge when we have patients with diabetes that may have impaired sensation. So that's a, a real concern. But when you're looking for footwear, then what might you be able to do to ensure that you um, are getting an appropriately fitting shoe? Um, well, unfortunately, there's very little guidance on how we would define um, the, uh, uh, the best fit. What we um, will often find is that we are quite comfortable um, in ensuring that we get an appropriate fit of footwear for our children because we recognize that feet are growing. But generally, you will tend to find that a lot of adults will probably not ask um, to have their feet properly measured when they go and buy shoes. And this is important as we tend to get older um, because um, there are distinct changes within our soft tissues, predominantly the collagen. Um, as we get older. And the foot really is quite collagen rich in the fact that our um, muscle tendons and our ligaments contain a lot of collagen. And generally, they will change as we get older with a tendency for the foot to um, widen. And so we have um, a stretch on our intermetatarsal ligament that we can see here. We will talk about this tendon in a little while. This is the posterior tibial tendon, which is really important in helping us maintain the arch of our foot. That can tend to get stretched over time, causing um, a lowering of the arch. And related to this, we can start to, to find a, a flattening of the arch, and that our foot will come out the way into what we refer to as a valgus or an inverted uh, position. So what we know is that as we get older, our foot is likely to change shape quite significantly. Um, very often, people will report that they've actually had to go up a shoe size. Now, it's unlikely that the foot length will have changed. It will be predominantly the width. So when people are finding that they're needing to go up a size um, to um, uh, get more width within the shoe, we can deduce that probably and that will be um, an ill-fitting shoe. So one of the key things that we can do is ensure um, that we get our feet properly measured. What we've also got to recognize with footwear is that um, uh, very similar to, to clothes, sometimes um, the size of clothes can vary dependent on which shop you visit. Likewise, 
just because you are a size seven in, in one brand does not necessarily mean that you're a size seven in another brand. It will all depend on the last that the um, shoemaker um, actually use it. So um, one of the key things that you can do is ensure that you have appropriately fitting footwear and ensure that you go and have your feet properly measured to ensure that you're not wearing a shoe um, that, that's too big and will not provide the appropriate support. So what kind of resources can you use to ensure perhaps that you are getting appropriately fitting footwear? Um, well, the Healthy Footwear Guide, um, which you can see the web link um, for at the bottom here, gives some really practical advice of things that you should look for when you're going for, for shoes. And what you will see is that it um, gives you some advice on um, how you can pinch the upper to make sure that the upper is not too big, ensuring that there's adequate space at the end, um, which should be um, just um, around six millimeters longer than your longest toe, um, and ensuring that we have adequate fastening and that we don't have too much slip um, on the rear foot. So um, this is available um, for you when you can download a, a PDF. Um, and this is the type of thing that you could um, take with you when you're um, getting shoes. One thing that's important to say is if you have been given some insoles for a foot problem, it's always important to ensure that you take that insole with you when you go and try and get some new shoes. Um, with an increasing array of shoes now that will have insoles that the manufacturer makes that are fully removable to ensure that then you can get your um, insole um, in there. The other practical thing to say is that as generally people tend to get older, um, uh, what you can sometimes find is that there's a tendency for the foot to swell towards the end of the day. And this generally can relate to as we get older, we might um, develop some problems with our veins like varicose veins. So the general advice is that you um, ensure that you go and get your footwear fitted at a time where your foot's more likely to be swollen. And that typically tends to be towards the end of the day. In terms of other useful information um, that you can have, then um, the um, Australian Podiatry Association um, has um, a patient-facing website where you can see, I've just taken um, an example from here, and it has a series of leaflets that you can access to find out a little bit more information. Um, around common foot problems, but also around um, advice on um, where, how you might be able to um, find appropriate shoes and ensure that you get them fitted properly. So when we start to think about um, some of our um, foot problems, we've talked about the importance of ensuring that we have appropriately fitting footwear. But it's important that you understand a little bit about how the foot functions so that then you can perhaps begin to understand where things can go wrong and how that can cause um, pain. So generally when we're walking, we need to have um, a sufficient range of movement in our joints. We need to have sufficient muscle strength. And generally we need to have pain-free movement. If we have um, pain during certain parts of the walking cycle, generally most people with in, um, intact sensation um, will um, compensate and try and adapt their walking style to avoid pain. What we generally tend to find is that um, we will need to um, put our heel down on the ground. And um, at this point, we have um, a huge amount of force that will be going through the foot. Generally, um, we recognize that that will be somewhere in the region of 110 to 120% of your body weight. If you walk faster, it may well exceed that. Once the foot is down on the ground and the heel bone, the calcaneus, is anatomically designed, it's a big bone and it has a nice cushioning heel pad underneath, the next job is to bring the um, tibia or your body over the stationary foot as it's on the ground. And to be able to do this, you need sufficient movement at the ankle joint, and you also need sufficient movement at the joint under the ankle joint that we refer to as the subtalar joint. That allows the foot to adapt 
to uneven terrain. Following managing to bring our body weight up and over our stationary foot, the last thing that we need to do is have sufficient bend in our toe joint to be able to go through what we refer to as propulsion. And effectively, you can visualize this as being a runner on a starting track, because generally, at this point in the walking cycle, we need our muscles to generate enough power um, to be able to power our foot off because most of the movement in swing, we actually don't use any muscles. Um, it relies on a good push off from the foot to take the limb through swing. And one of the key things that we will look for when we're looking to see um, adequate um, function of the foot is things like pressure measurement, which we can see here. And we will look for something um, like a normal force time curve, which we can see here. And we can see that we have a big peak of activity when our heel is down on the ground and our period of weight acceptance. And then we can see that we have another big burst of activity as we're needing to push the foot off um, the ground. And what parts of the foot tend to be loaded? Um, well, this is a, a diagram which is combining the force time curve that we've just talked about with um, highlighted areas of which parts of the foot um, are contributing um, to the, the, the kind of uh, force time curve. And you can see that we have a big contribution from both the rear foot and the forefoot. So what we now need to think about is that if we have problems in those anatomical regions, how we are likely to compensate and perhaps what treatment interventions we can do to try and um, uh, manage those problems. One of the biggest challenges that we have um, is um, our inability to compensate for problems at the rear foot. Um, we have very little choice in not putting the heel down on the ground. What we tend to find is when people have rear foot problems, they will often be um, uh, more disabled than patients that tend to have problems in the front part of the foot because generally people can compensate easier and not push through the forefoot, but generally there's little choice um, in being able to control the, the force that goes through the rear foot. So when we think about some of our key structures that um, are in the rear foot, we really think about our Achilles tendon, which you can see highlighted here green. We think about uh, a tendon called posterior tibial tendon, and you can see that this is highlighted here green. And this is a really important tendon because it inserts into all of the bones of the tarsus, with the exception of the, the, the talus, which just sits just under the ankle joint. So when we have a problem with this tendon, it really does have a big impact on the posture of the foot. We think about our plantar fascia that we can see highlighted here. And again, you can see that it's a significant structure going from the um, calcaneus, the heel bone, through into the forefoot. And we think about our plantar heel pad. So when we think about how we would typically compensate for if we have problems in the rear foot, this is our typical compensation that we would see. We can see that we have this distinct absence of the, the peak, the initial peak of weight acceptance that we would see here, and that generally we tend to find that there's a reluctance to have that peak of load um, in the rear foot and um, compensating in the forefoot as well. So when we think about our Achilles tendon, our Achilles tendon is a really important structure. And what we can see um, here is um, it inserts into the heel bone at the back. And this is an extended field of view ultrasound image that we can see here. And this is of a normal tendon. And what we can see is hopefully you can see this distinct structure that's inserting into um, this white area here, which is the contour of the back of our heel bone, our calcaneus. And you'll see that this is highlighted here. And so it's a really significant um, tendon. Um, and what we can often find is when we have pathology in the tendon, it's very common to have um, pathology in two key areas, either in the mid portion 
and we think that sometimes we get problems there because of the um, uh, decreased vascularity of the tendon. This is where we will often tend to have problems, and this is often an area where if the tendon is going to rupture, it tends to rupture in this area where we um, know that it has slightly less vascularity. Or we can have problems at the insertion. What we do know in terms of Achilles tendon problems, there are certain risk factors that we know of. Because the Achilles tendon is the um, structure that inserts from the calf muscle unit, then if there's tightness and dysfunction there, then there is an increased risk of developing problems with the Achilles tendon. There have been studies that show um, risk factors include um, we're more likely to develop problems in the tendon as we get older. There are, again, some um, uh, kind of uh, relationships with body weight and height, um, also certain types of foot posture, particularly high arched feet, and if people have had a previous lateral ankle sprain and have developed some of the ligaments there, uh, problems with the ligaments there. When we come down and look at where the tendon inserts, what we can see is we have a fluid-filled plaque called a bursa which we can see on the ultrasound scan is this dark area here, which is full of fluid. And what we can also see is as the tendon comes over um, at the insertion point, we can see that it's significantly thickened. I've highlighted the contour shape of the heel bone here, and you can see that this is the contour of the heel bone um, on the ultrasound scan. And you can see that this shows considerable thickening um, of the tendon if you think back to the previous image where um, the tendon just nicely um, merges with the um, calcaneus. What we know is with the insertional problems, which are a little bit different to the problems in the mid-portion, is when we have the inflamed tissue that sits over the calcaneus, over time um, we can start to see some changes um, in the actual heel bone themselves. So this is an irregularity of the bone, which then can start to mechanically irritate the overlying tendon. So we can see highlighted by the arrow there that that's um, a potential site for ongoing um, problems with that tendon. So what do we know about the treatments that we have um, for the Achilles tendon problems? Well, generally, um, on the whole, um, there's probably more evidence to support the use of um, exercises or what we often refer to as loading protocols. It's really important, however, um, that um, people get advice on the right loading regime because it can differ depending on pain, function, um, the site of tendinopathy, if we have things like irregularities on the back of the heel bone or calcification within the tendon. And there isn't one loading program that will suit everybody. So it's always worthwhile going and getting some advice from um, a podiatrist or physiotherapist in terms of what the right program may well be. There's evidence for the use of ultrasound guided injections um, in non athletic populations for Achilles tendon problems. There's some evidence for the use um, of. Um, insoles, um, however, no added benefit over the um, loading program um, for the physiotherapy. And there's um, sparse evidence for interventions like for tissue mobilization. When we now think about um, plantar heel pain, um, this is another challenging problem. And um, really, with quite a high prevalence in the in the general population, um, it's been estimated that um, around 10% of people in the USA will present with heel pain over the course of their lives, and 83% of those will be during their working um, uh, life. So it has the potential to have significant um, uh, cost implications for society. What we know, very similar to some of the um, things that we've already talked about, increased body mass is a strong risk factor for developing plantar heel problems. And there is some suggestion that um, changes in foot posture can predispose people to plantar heel pain. 
those that have occupations that um, involve prolonged standing or an increased risk and generally inappropriate footwear, particularly when combined when people have a, um, a kind of a, a health, uh, you know, a fitness kick and rapidly increase their activity um, uh, combined with inappropriate footwear can often be the start of um, uh, plantar heel pain. We can see in this image here um, an x-ray of a plantar heel spur and it's um, it's difficult to know whether there is a strong relationship between the presence of heel spurs um, and um, plantar fasciitis, for example. Very often they're considered to be um, a um, coincidental imaging finding, um, but because very often they're found when people have plantar heel pain, very often people assume that the spur is a cause of the plantar heel pain, but um, the relationship is not quite so clear. So what would the presenting um, symptoms of plantar fasciitis be? Well, pain and discomfort in the plantar fascial region, which we can see being palpated here. This is where one of the major insertions is. And one of the characteristic things is that um, it's pain on first weight bearing. So when people first get up in the morning, they will describe that it's um, really disabling foot pain, which tends to get a little bit better as they've walked around, but then comes on and is quite problematic towards the end of the day. Because it has quite a predictable clinical pattern, very often a diagnosis is made on clinical examination and imaging like ultrasound or um, MRI scans very often are reserved for when people have um, failed to respond to interventions or their um, clinical pattern is not quite consistent with the normal pattern of plantar fasciitis. Here we see an ultrasound scan that shows um, a patient that had um, plantar fasciitis affecting one side. And what we can see is this structure here, this dark structure here, um, and this is the calcaneus bone, and this is the thickness of the plantar fascia. And we expect um, a thickness of around um, four um, uh, um, millimeters. And generally, when we start to see above four and a half millimeters, that's often consistent with symptoms of plantar fasciitis. And we can see um, when we compare the symptomatic side to the non-symptomatic side, we can see that there's a significant, it's almost double the thickness. So ultrasound imaging can be quite useful in terms of um, monitoring the effect of intervention. And certainly an improvement in symptoms does tend to correlate with a reduction in the thickness of the plantar fascia over time. When we think about the varying treatment options for plantar heel pain, well, there's lots of um, interventions, including anti-inflammatory drugs, orthotics, physical therapy, shockwave therapy, um, laser therapy, and steroid injections. Um, however, whilst there are an array um, of treatments, generally, um, there is very little guidance as to which treatment intervention might be superior compared to the other. The recent study um, suggested that really the common used treatment, um, generally there is very little difference um, in um, whether one is superior relative to the other. Um, generally, the combination of a steroid injection um, with exercise um, and extra, um, shock, uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy would seem to be most effective for the management of short, medium and long-term pain or function. However, we've always got to consider the relative um, merits versus risk. Um, so we can see that there's um, lots more research that, that's needed here. When we move on and think about um, problems with the posterior tibial um, tendon, which is often referred to as posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, um, again, this is a relatively common foot problem. Um, it's around 3% in females over 40, but as we tend to get older, it can affect up to about 10% of um, uh, the um, elderly population. What we tend to know is that there are some recognized risk factors. So sometimes people can have the presence of an extra bone, an accessory bone, and we can see on this x-ray here um, where the arrows are that we have um, an extra um, bone just near the navicula. Um, which is where the tendon would be. Um, we have one within the tendon here, 
and one where um, the um, accessory ossicle is actually kind of fused with the navicula. And very often the problems um, associated in this area is where the navicular bone becomes very prominent and gets mechanically irritated and rubbed from footwear. Other in, um, conditions can predispose to problems with the tendon, um, particularly inflammatory joint diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, connective tissue disorders like hypermobility. What we do know is when people have problems with this tendon, um, it can be correlated with um, uh, musculoskeletal complaints elsewhere in the body, particularly um, pain um, at the front part of the knee, low back pain, and the development of osteoarthritis changes in the midfoot. So again, we have a relatively um, lack of um, high quality evidence um, for um, posterior tibial dysfunction. One of the key things that we um, aim to do as podiatrists is to try and um, support the medial longitudinal arch with something um, like an orthotic here, so to provide stability at the point where the tendon inserts in. And we will be very concerned when we see early changes, as we see here with the pressure profiles, where we can see loading in the midfoot. Um, on this, this one side where we can see that the deformity is worse. Generally, the um, consensus is, is that the earlier you can intervene, the better the outcome will be. But this has got to be taken in the context of the fact that generally we have um, a lacking of high quality evidence to support um, our interventions here. When we move on to the forefoot, um, you can see as I'm putting these anatomical structures on that the anatomy of the forefoot is really quite complex with lots of muscles, um, uh, ligaments, um, and our nerves and blood vessels. As we tend to get older, we will have changes um, uh, to the, the joint, specifically in the forefoot. Um, osteoarthritis is more common where we tend to see joint space narrowing. That will influence the range of movement that we have in joints. We will often develop, um, this is showing an ultrasound scan of a, a joint in the black area here, that I will just put my laser point on here, is the articular cartilage. And what we tend to find is that will thin over time. And we can develop things called osteophytes, which are bony proliferations just at the joint margins, which we can see here as well. And that can significantly reduce the amount of movement at the joint. What we can also see is the development of significant foot deformities like hallux abductor valgus. Um, when we start to see big changes in the um, first um, toe joint, because it's anatomically bigger than the others, often we will tend to find when we have compensation problems across um, the um, ball of the foot. So hallux valgus, as we can see here, um, is a really common um, foot deformity. And generally, it's where we see changes within the joint, but combined with these soft tissue changes. Often, we will get a rub across the joint and the development of a bursa, which is a little bit like a blister, but it sits under the skin. Again, what we tend to know is that as people get older, our prevalence of um, hallux valgus will increase. Footwear has been implicated in the development of hallux valgus, although um, we do um, see hallux valgus deformity in populations that um, infrequently wear shoes. So it's not causative, but it certainly um, can um, uh, accelerate the, the, the deformity. Low arch profile has often been considered to be a contributing factor, and certainly data from the Flemington data set suggests that those patients that had a low arch had a higher odds ratio of having either hallux abductor valgus or hallux rigidus, which is where we can see we've got a bony lump at the top of the joint, limiting the range of movement. However, um, we haven't got the angular deformity, as we can see here. What we, again, um, recognize is that there really is um, a lack of high quality evidence to support the um, use of treatment interventions. Generally, what we see is distinct changes in pressure profiles when people have hallux abductor valgus with very often high focal pressures, um, predominantly over the second metatarsal head, as we can see here. Um, 
I've got, um, sorry, I'm really, really sorry. I just need to. Uh, sorry, I'm just doing a webinar. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, I'm just doing a webinar. I'm really sorry about that. That was security wanting to, to, to come and throw me out of the building. So I apologize. Um, um, so, um, yes. What we will often look to do is to have um, insoles that predominantly will try and improve symptoms by reducing the high focal pressures that we will see across the front part of the foot. To date, there's only been really two randomized clinical trials specifically focusing on osteoarthritis at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. And those have included insoles and rocker shoes. What they found is both of those interventions showed a clinically meaningful improvement, um, but really there was no difference between the two treatment interventions. When we think about um, other challenges that we will see in the front part of the foot, then very often it relates to high foot pressures associated with changes in um, the, the joint position. Very often as people get older, the toes become retracted, the fatty padding tends to be displaced, and we will often start to get callosities, um, hard skin, as we can see here, and sometimes bursa, which are these um, fluid-filled sacs that form um, under the skin that can become irritated. And what we will find is that the amount of soft tissue as we get older tends to reduce, as we can see here, and very often becoming um, around two to three millimeters of fat protecting the metatarsal head. So a big um, area um, for opportunities to try and reduce symptoms in the front part of the foot is using things like insoles to try and reduce the pressures across the front part of the foot, predominantly by trying to take um, load into the arch, pressure equals force over area. If we can increase the contact area of the foot, we automatically will reduce pressures across the front part of the foot and generally, the research suggests that when we reduce pressures, we um, reduce pain. One other consideration is whether we actually start to develop lesions between the metatarsals. And when we start to see deformities like this, we can often be suspicious of the development of bursas between the metatarsal heads or development of something called a neuroma, which is where we get irritation of the nerves that run up between the metatarsal heads. And one of the approaches is, is that um, the transverse metatarsal arch, you can see the metatarsals here often form this transverse arch, is to try and use something like this, like a metatarsal dome, to try and support this transverse metatarsal arch and to try and decompress any lesions that may form underneath. Ultrasound, as we can see here, to guide injections into um, neuroma or bursa um, have been shown to be um, useful, but again, there is limited evidence to support their use. When we think around our skin, generally as we get older, um, we will see thinning of the skin. Very often, our skin starts to get drier because we have uh, our sebaceous glands that are not as effective at secreting the, the lubricant. Um, we may well see um, our skin generally becomes more fragile, and we've always got to be um, looking for potential pigmentation problems. Um, very often, people forget to put sun cream on their feet, so and very often will not look at them very well. So it's always important to look um, for potential um, development of melanoma. Any lesion that's irregular, change in shape or colour. Um, the recommendation will be to get that checked out. When we think about our um, nails, then one of the key things that we um, uh, recognize is generally they will tend to get thicker as people get older and can be more challenging to cut. Um, there's potentially an increased um, prevalence of things like fungal infections as people potentially become a little bit more immunocompromised, particularly if they have other medical conditions. And as nails become difficult to cut, then sometimes we can end up with instances like this, um, where people really have struggled to cut their toenails and then become quite embarrassed about seeking help. The thing to say is that all of these um, conditions, um, a podiatrist 
um, uh, would um, be able to, to cut these nails down very, very quickly, um, reduce symptoms, and it's certainly not anything to, to kind of for patients to feel that they're too embarrassed to go and seek help. This is an example of an ingrown toenail, which again, um, with a look on aesthetic, if someone's um, uh, suitable, the nail can be trimmed back very quickly and this would re resolve very, very um, well. So really, um, people um, often don't recognize um, the scope of a podiatrist and what a podiatrist can do. They're highly skilled professionals that are able to look at the biomechanics and look towards um, orthotics to try and um, improve foot function, but also can um, inject joints and do minor surgical procedures. Um, so um, generally, I would um, recommend that um, people do consider if they have foot problems going and seeing a podiatrist and getting um, some specific advice of how to best manage their foot problems. So to conclude, um, foot problems really are common. Um, and it is very surprising that we still have such a lack of research um, to, to guide clinicians on how to best treat some of the, the common foot problems. Footwear is absolutely essential. It can be a major source of foot pain. Um, so I would always recommend that people ensure that they go and have their footwear properly fitted. And there are lots of resources there, um, particularly um, uh, through the uh, podiatry professional um, website. And here you can see that I've got the link um, to the College of Podiatry at the bottom, which is a UK-based um, resource. But a lot of the information is relevant to um, people in Australia and information from the Australian Podiatry Association. Thank you. Thanks very much, Debbie, for a very comprehensive presentation. It's interesting, you know, uh, I'm just intrigued as to why there is um, so little research, uh, you know, uh, in the sort of uh, area of podiatry and, and in relation to feet. I mean, they're such an incredibly important part of our, our bodies. Um, so why, why do you think that is? Are, are they just taken for granted? I think they are taken for granted. And I think... Um, you know, um, very often they're regarded as not being very sexy either. Um, so from a funding perspective, um, I think the fact that very often we can hide our uh, feet away in shoes, um, very often they're, they're hidden. And even in conditions where we know that there are um, major impacts, um, like diabetes, for example, um, there is still the suggestion that a lot of health professionals simply don't ask patients about problems with their feet. Um, and certainly um, don't do that in routine consultation. Um, so I think that it's, it's a number of factors. Um, uh, I encourage people to uh, type in any questions that they have about the presentation. Uh, there's one question that's come through, Debbie, in relation to um, a query, does Morton's foot affect load to the second and third MTP joints? Um, yeah, there, there is a, um, a suggestion that um, the alignment, um, so the, the shape of the metatarsal heads, but also um, the length of the digits can um, affect the, um, the load patterns that, that um, people can have, um, absolutely. What we do tend to find is whilst pressure measurement is a really useful tool, um, what we actually know is that there's a lot of variability um, from person to person as well. Um, so uh, often what you will tend to find is that, yes, there, there might be issues related to um, the, 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 sh the geometry and the length of the metatarsals, but also it can be to do with perhaps um, compensations elsewhere. So it can be really challenging in terms of, of, of saying, yes, this relates to this because um, you know people compensate in a, a number of different ways, but yes, certainly, um, the, uh, the alignment of the transverse metatarsal arch and um, the length of the second relative to the first and the third have certainly been implicated um, in, in symptoms in the forefoot, yes. Another question, Debbie, that uh, I know probably very much depends on individual circumstances. Someone's asking um, uh, a question in regards to how successful is surgery? Yeah, um, I, I think... Um, 
what you will find is that there's um, lots of different surgical approaches as well. Um, and I think that um, it's always, um, most people really um, wouldn't want to consider undertaking surgery until someone has exhausted what we regard as being conservative treatment. Um, because as and when um, you have an invasive procedure, we always want to try and look at risk versus benefit. And once you've got, you know, kind of, um, you know, anaesthetics and wound healing and the chances of infection and bones not, you know, kind of uniting, um, then obviously there's significant um, risks associated with that. Generally, foot surgery has moved on significantly. Um, there's um, certainly um, in the in the UK there are national databases of um, of you know kind of different procedures and success dependent on how people present. Um, but yeah, there, there, there'll be lots of, of factors that would need to be considered. Um, but generally, I think that. Um, uh, speak to um, the, the surgeon that you're um, going to be uh, liaising with, um, see how many procedures that they've done, what their general success rates are, um, and, and most surgeons will be happy to discuss that. And Debbie, does uh, the regular wearing of orthotics cause a stiff foot? Um, there's, um, as you can see from, from the talk today, that, that generally we have so little evidence for some of our major cornerstones of, of care um, that generally we don't have the long-term studies to suggest um, you know, whether there are benefits to wearing orthotics or whether there might be negatives um, to wearing orthotics over time. Um, generally, um, most patients are given orthotics because they have had usually foot pain, um, and um, dependent on what the, the mechanical reasons for, for, for getting the orthotics um, were, would depend on whether that's a treatment that would be needed, um, you know, kind of as a permanent, um, you know, kind of intervention. Sometimes it can be that things are needed more short term. Uh, and Debbie, um, are there any medical conditions that may predispose uh, someone to stress fractures of of the MT? I'm sorry, I don't know what that stands for. Um, so I'm assuming that they possibly mean um, metatarsal. Um, so in terms of stress fractures, um, yeah, there, um, there, there are two ways in which a stress fracture can happen. One is that it's relatively normal load on a, on a bone that isn't normal, i.e. a bone that has reduced bone mineral density. And there's lots of different medical conditions um, that can be associated with that, generally as people get older, particularly females, um, once they've gone through the, the menopause, will have a, a reduction in their bone mineral density. Um, so it could be kind of normal factors on a, on a, a bone with um, low mineral density or it could be that it's a normal bone with um, increased mechanical load. And that's often when we start to see um, those injuries in, in kind of the military or in you know, people that are doing lots of running, um, for example. Um, again, there is some suggestion that uh, there's two sites that are a little bit more predisposed, the second and the fifth. Um, and yes, yeah, things that might mechanically overload those areas um, might increase the risk. And Debbie, what do uh, podiatrists do to help people with diabetic foot pain? With diabetic foot pain, um, it, it, pain is a, a very complex um, area, and then very often the, the challenge with people with diabetes is the absence of pain. Um, when people do have um, pain, um, it's really dependent. It could be coming from a, a number of different um, uh, sources. And um, sometimes when people have very poor blood sugar, that can be associated with um, something that we call um, positive neuropathy. Um, so there are certain things, very often a podiatrist um, would be working as part of a multidisciplinary team. There are certain, um, you know, kind of treatments that, that can be piloted. Um, but it really it would be the first job would be to try and find where the origin of the pain is coming from. And what are your comments about uh, per perineal, I think, split pairs? Is it is okay. this best managed in a moon boot or rehab? 
Um, it really depends. So the so the perineal tendons are um, that. So what we were talking about the posterior tibial tendon, the perineal tendons are on, on the other side, and they're equally as in, uh, important as the post-tib tendon. They're two tendons that sit next to each other, and it probably depends on where the tear is and and what the cause has been. Sometimes if there's um, irregularities on the side of the bone, they can mechanically irritate. Um, um, if we've had some damage of ligaments or some, some structures called retinaculum, the tendons can actually dislocate as people are, are walking. So it would depend just exactly. Um, there's a lot of potential areas where that tear could be. If it's up near the ankle joint, if it's down more towards the, the, the bottom of the um, you know, the base of the fifth toe um, will will kind of depend on where it is, um, how bad it is, um, as to, to, to kind of what the, the best intervention may be. And Debbie, do you think uh, foot massage is good for foot for, for foot problems? Um, there really um, is, is very little um, evidence um, to, to kind of support um, the, the use of, of foot massage. Um, I certainly have had a lot of patients that um, get benefit then they describe that they have like pain and tension in their feet and that, that by um, having the massage um, increases their local circulation. Um, certainly, you know, patients report a, a short-term benefit. Um, there's certainly no evidence to suggest um, that massage does harm. Um, but it's again one of those areas where there's probably little evidence to, to, to suggest that it really is um, effective as a long term. And someone recently had three bones in uh, their uh, left midfoot fused and um, will have the same surgery done on their right foot and is just commenting that it's uh, removed uh, their arthritis immediately. Um, so yeah. good result. Yeah. Any comment there? Yeah. Um, I would say that um, uh, generally having arthritis in the middle part of the foot um, is probably um, one of the areas where we know the little about. Um, certainly what we do know is that um, uh, arthritis in the midfoot very often doesn't um, respond well to orthotics. Um, so it's, it's excellent to hear that um, someone has, has had a good result from having some fusion there. Very often small amounts of movement. Those joints don't move very, very much, but very often it's the bone-on-bone -bone contact that causes significant pain. So the surgery to stop those bones moving, um, you know, can certainly, um, you know, be, be very, very successful. But again, it's an area where we have very little um, research to support, um, you know, kind of uh, interventions like that. Debbie, what's the height to weight relationship you mentioned that has an association with Achilles tendonitis? Uh, so um, generally what you tend to, to kind of um, find is that um, when we're looking at um, Achilles tendon and we're looking at um, how we might measure and define pathology, certainly what we tend to, to know is that, um, that we can expect the tendon to be a little bit thicker um, when people are a little bit more active. Um, certainly in terms of just um, kind of tightness of structures. Um, uh, so generally when you're wanting to try and compare, you would want to try and match as, as much as possible. Um, but yeah, again, um, uh, tightness um, and um, an increase in, in body mass um, is, is supposed to increase the mechanical tension in the structure and predispose it to problems. Uh, and uh, how successfully are leg length discrepancies managed with a heel wedge or lift? Um, it depends in terms of um, the magnitude, so how big the, the leg length discrepancy is, um, and it depends where it's coming from. So when we um, look at leg length discrepancy, we can call something um, like a, a functional leg length difference or an actual leg length difference. So sometimes people can appear to have a difference in the length of their legs, but it might be because perhaps they have a problem like a scoliosis in the spine. So functionally, it's as if they have a leg length difference, but not, not all of it is actually coming from a physical difference in the length of the legs. Um, generally, um, 
what you tend to find is that sometimes there are some typical compensations that you expect, but because um, so, i.e., we expect um, the um, shortest um, leg to, to kind of be a little bit more high arched, for example, but that's not always the case because people will tend to compensate a little bit at the pelvis or at the spine. Um, but yet, um, kind of the um, heel raises can be quite effective. Um, but generally, when you have a heel raise, you might encourage tightening. Um, in the hamstrings and the um, calf muscles at the back. So generally, you would want to incorporate that with some stretching as well. Um, yet, yeah, um, there's a, a question there just in terms of um, stretching and strengthening um, for, the, for the calf muscles and for plantar fasciitis. Um, what we do know is that the, the calf muscle, um, the fibres, of the Achilles tendon do actually combine. Um, there is no distinct separation between those and the plantar fascia. So yes, generally, um, most um, clinicians um, would, would kind of combine um, uh, kind of some stretching and icing and um, work for the plantar fascia, but would also look to do um, that for the Achilles tendon as well, because the two structures are intrinsically linked. I just wanted to say thanks again, Debbie, and thanks, everyone. Have a good evening, and if you could take a moment to complete the exit survey. Thanks, everyone, and good night.